Okay. Uh, Russell Winder uh, will talk to you about big computation in Python. Uh, he'll take questions again if there's time afterwards. So um, over to Russell. Thank you very much. Uh, right, so that's not plug. Uh, I wasn't quite ready. That, no, no, it's not your fault, it's this fault. That's better. Right, um, big computation in Python. Um, but first of all, let's have a quick preface, because you have to have prefaces. Um, 2006, um, ACU had a Python track. There was no Python UK at all. And then this gentleman decided, mostly because Zeth told him to, that we should actually have a Python conference. And we get this absolutely spondicious quote, what we really need to do is set up a UK Python conference. And so Zeth, John, a few others did exactly that. And in 2017, um, so two, 2007 in Birmingham was the first PyCon UK. And to quote Max Boyce in an inappropriate uh, way, I, well, in a, not inappropriate in terms of content, inappropriate in terms of I can't do the accent, is I know because I was there or something of that sort. Uh, and I've got the t-shirt to prove it. So 10 years on, there have been eight PyCon UKs, and I shall leave that one as an exercise for the student. <laughs> so well done, John. So introduction to my talk. Well, it's really part two of the one I did last year, uh, because I ran out of time last year. So I thought I'd do the second half this year. But of course, most of you probably weren't there. So um, there was supposed to be a joke there, but I missed it. Never mind. Uh, there we go. Presentation. So uh, what happened last year was something roughly like this. We'll notice the word no comes up quite a lot. Okay, so that was uh, 25 minutes last year. So that's the summary. <laughs> I have summarized. Actually, what's the real summary for today? And we've got this slide. Okay, so we're here because we like Python. The problem is it's a Python conference. That's part of the problem. Have you noticed in conferences we've got this way of trying to have a Go conference, a Fortran conference, a Python conference? And we've lost, except at ACU, of course, we've lost the mixed language thing. And the sad thing about Python is it's not good at everything. It's very good at some things. And, well, C is not very good at all. Let's just forget that. Um, C++, I'm sure there are some C++ folks around. Um, I commiserate. And so we've got languages like Rust, D, and Chapel. And my contention is that as Python programmers, we should not be rejecting these languages. That we should actually be looking to use the right language for the right purpose at the right time. And I'm contending that we are not doing that. That as Python people, we tend to look too inward and want Python to do everything and invent Cython and number and stuff like that to stop actually looking at languages like these. Whereas, in fact, we should be embracing multiple languages. Now, in order to investigate this, we need a problem. And since at least 2007, some of you have probably noticed that I've always used this problem. And it's clearly not a real, not a real problem, because it involves words like quadrature. And very few people actually understand what that means. Hopefully, most people understand what pi means. 
on the grounds that it's approximately 3.141592658, blah, 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 blah. Or, if you want it another way, tau by two. <laughs> exactly. So I thought what we really need for this is a more realistic problem, a problem that people out there would, re a technique people would really use in the real world. So pi by Monte Carlo. Yep, people do Monte Carlo calculations. I know I did for my PhD, 11 dimensional integrals. You can't do it because, well, you just can't do it. So you do it by Monte Carlo. Standard problem. What are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at areas in circles. Okay, so assuming that this is actually a unit, whoop, whoop, no, I'm in the wrong place, a unit circle, its area is going to be pi because that's just the way things are. And so if you go from naught to one, I should just change specs. Um, these are not rose colored, by the way. They're just anti-migraine specs. So if we go from naught to one on the x-axis and naught to one on the y-axis, and we throw dots at random in here, then we're effectively finding out what the area is in here, which is pi by four. Now, unlike pi by quadrature, pi by Monte Carlo is representative of real problems out there in the universe. So after a decade, I've finally become real. Two-dimensionally real. Okay, so we must have code because we must have code. So if I go down here and we need to make this thing at least way, way bigger. No, uh, uh, way, way bigger. Okay, does that work for people at the back? I'm getting some nods from at least halfway down, so we'll take that as good. I'm in the wrong directory, rats. Okay, so here we are in the Python directory, and we've got some um, files. We can have a, look at, a quick look at... Um, Oh, and we're going to have to uh, make that a bit bigger, and, uh, ooh, no, I didn't intend to do that. Uh, I've done it again. Uh, we need to up the size of that so you can actually see it, and probably bring it a bit more central. Okay, font size working? So, yes from the front, no from the back, so I'm, I'll have to make it a little bit bigger. So here we have, we're just doing a sum. Nice and functional. We like functional. Um, and so we, we're doing calling of this, summing over it for some range or other. Yeah, you can read Python. And we've got some random number generation. Okay, so two-dimensional little square, X and Y, randomly create them. And we decide whether it's inside or whether it's outside. So if it's inside, we'll return one. If it's outside, we'll return zero. So we're summing the number of times we get a hit inside. That's the essence of Monte Carlo. And an awful lot of uh, finance relies on this technique. You know, you throw a dart at a board, and if it's in the right place, you do the right thing. If it's in the wrong place, you sell somebody else's money. <laughs> Okay, so that's the essence of these uh, computations, and we're going to use Python 3 because you don't let friends use Python 2. So we actually want to run this, so we better run this, and on this machine, it's going to take about 3.38 oh, seconds. Not statistically significant, just an indicator. Single point, we, we're not going to make vast claims, we're just getting indicators, making hypotheses. 3.14, well, that will do, particularly as far as some parts of the USA were concerned who wanted to legislate pi to equal 3.14. 3.14.
Some people don't know the history, never mind. Talk to me later. 3.38, not particularly good. Okay, that, that's really true. So um, most people at this point would immediately say, oh, the great um, way of doing any of this sort of stuff is we'll do it with NumPy. Because. And that gets you somewhere looking roughly like that. So we'll create a couple of arrays of random numbers. Um, technical jargon, parallel arrays, because they're one-dimensional arrays sitting in parallel, so they're indexed the same. Uh, I, I should draw a little map there, shouldn't I? So if we've got one array and we've got another array, parallel arrays, because that's index zero, that's index zero, index one, index one, and you're just going down them in parallel. And we're doing that in this case with the function f, which takes a value from one, a value from other, produces the result, and effectively sticks it in another numpy array. And then we use numpy sum over the numpy array. Classic numpy way of doing things. Would people agree? You're allowed to say no, because, pardon? Uh, vectorize is bad. Exactly, but what's the right way of doing it in NumPy? There isn't one. Let, let me back up that statement by going down here and just let's run that one. Because NumPy, C library, C is fast, C is great, hidden from Pythoneers by NumPy. Brilliant, pure Python, faster than NumPy. Now I know why that is. You could consider it to be a sleight of hand because I don't like NumPy. <laughs> but there you are, we have the truth. And the truth is NumPy's slow. And so then people come up and say, right, well, let's, let's make Python fast. And they'll say, let's use Cython and we send those people out of the room. They can go somewhere else. But what we would do, perhaps, is admit the existence of number. Whoops, I don't mean to see the I'm on a diggy. The existence of number, and, well, I should have had these pre-prepared, shouldn't I? That was a bit naughty of me. Uh, ooh, there we go. So, we, well, that's a bit too big, isn't it? There we go. So it's the same little loop down here. We've just got a function that does the work, replacing the sum over um, comprehension. But what we've got up here, there we are, we have a function. And we JIT it. And this is going to be cool, because that's going to generate uh, LLVM, and LLVM's fast. But look at the horrendous Python we have to write. We're basically writing assembly language in Python. But then that's the number way. On the other hand, what happens if we actually run that? Hmm. Okay. It's, um, Hey, that's good. The clock's telling me it's quarter past. Excellent timekeeper. Um, so, okay, number. No, not bad, but still pretty awful. Because we've got to write horrible code. It's sort of imperative, and it's loopy, and we've lost all the benefits of having higher order functions and a more declarative approach. We've lost use of sum. Uh, so, how can we get it back? Well, let's get rid of Python, shall we? Seems like a good idea. So instead, let's go initially, because I've got a couple of minutes, let's go to D, because I like D. And if I just have a quick look at the, uh, the code. Uh, 
Okay, so we have the core of the, whoops, sorry, apologies. Okay, the core of this is the reduce function in there, which in essence is exactly the same as Python reduce. You have a lambda function, and you have a start point, and you have an iterator. So iota generates naught to n, n dot iota generates naught to n, zero is the initial value, and we then reduce by adding a call of f. So in essence, the algorithm is identical to the Python code. Okay, yes, we have got some extra bits and pieces, you know, like the word immutable. Whoops, sorry. And where's our function? We're calling some uniform distribution. So it's exactly the same as random in, in Python. Yeah, as Python people, we could almost like this. And indeed, a lot of hedge funds folks in London are switching from Python to D um, because it's a, it's a relatively easy switch. So what about, I've pre-compiled this, obviously, because compilation takes a little while. Uh, so let's just run that. Okay, that's um, pretty cool. Uh, we get the same performance as number-based Python code, but we didn't have to lose all the, nice, the niceness of higher-order functions and declarative programming. We got the performance without the nastiness. But even better, if we make a slight change to that, and instead of using sequential code, we use parallel code. Oh, the function hasn't changed. So we're using a sequential function there, but that's right, because what we're doing is we're using a parallel reduce. So we haven't done much work. We just said, oh, right, okay. Instead of doing a sequential re reduce, let's just do a reduce on a task pool. And the task pool is going to do all the work for us. Now, sadly, because the connections out of here aren't too cool, I can't get to my workstation reliably, so I'm having to run it locally here. But if I actually run this code, it should be twice as fast. Uh, excuse me, I forgot, I, I rubbed out the pie, didn't I? Because um, this has got two processing units in it, uh, hyperthreads, don't worry about hyperthreads, they are meaningless. Um, so although it says four cores, it's only got two cores, really, because it's two cores plus two hyperthreads, and two hyperthreads are useless. And it roughly went twice as fast, which not statistically significant, but really rather interesting. Um, okay, so D is good. Um, we can do lots of fun stuff with D, but I did mention, I should mention Chapel. Not Welsh Chapel, but Chapel the programming language. No, that one didn't go down too well, never mind. So here we have a number of implementations. I'll just work with the four ones, because four is not what you think, really. It's... Um, It's, well, I suppose it is four, really. But it, it's actually a for loop over some number, but we're now using zips to deal with that. Um, time of start, time of stop, yeah. But here's our for loop over a parallel array because we are iterating over, in this case, a random stream. So we create our random stream up here, we create two of them, one for each of the parallel arrays. We then put them through a zip, and we have zip in Python, so not that unusual. But we're also giving it an index, so we've got index range one, range two. And we're summing, okay, it's a little bit iterative, I agree, but it's not too, not too bad. So how's that going to work in terms of performance? 
Oops, I need to get rid of the chapel. I need to get rid of the DE. Run that. Eh, not too bad. That's the sequential form. Roughly the same as the D. What happens if we then want to go to the parallel form? We uh, use this bit of code. DE that. Oops, comes out all over the place. Whoop, sorry for the bounciness there. So again, we make our two random streams. Again, we do our for all, R. Ah, so we just change a for, which is sequential, into a for all, which is parallel. And we've added a little bit of extra stuff on, on here, which is a, um, a with thing, which just tells it that it's going to do a global reduce over the sum. So there's going to be multiple threads, scatter, gather, and we just have to tell it that we're going to reduce on the sum variable so that it does the right locking on there. If I run that one, Point one seven. So it's done half of it on two cores. Half. Well, the sad thing is, of course, that I needed to do this on a cray to have some real impact. And most people, as soon as you say cray, think of that round thing from 1962, of which the performance is beaten by your phone. But no, actually, what I'm thinking of in terms of a cray, whoops, where am I going? down here is something looking a bit more like that. So today, that well, two years ago, that would be your cray. And you're thinking, ooh, that's not very big. That's only about seven cabinets. Um, well, actually, no. It's quite a few more cabinets. And there's a few hundred thousand processing units in it. And if I'd been able to get a connection up to the US to log into this beastie, we would have found that my calculation would have taken zero time for about 100 billion throws of the dice. Yeah, we would have just flattened the whole floor with this. What's the moral of all this? Because I'm fortunate I've just realized that I've over, overrun my 21 minutes. Um, so what are the conclusions? Um, native code is good for big computation. Python is useless for big computation. And what I mean by big computation is making the processor run hot. I do not care about I.O. All the web stuff, forget it. That's I.O. We're talking about big computation. The decisions that decide whether you have a pension pot or not. You know, it's really important stuff, as opposed to the pictures of kittens. <laughs> and the big story, the reason why the numpy fails and the, the chapel stuff succeeds is parallel iterators. The numpy stuff was using arrays. Arrays are useless for parallel computation. Completely and totally useless. You need parallel iterators. And I implore you, do not be afraid of polyglot. I ran out of time. I would have shown Python calling D, Python calling chapel. So you do your matplotlib locally. You do your computation in the US or wherever on Hopper, on uh, Edison. Some of the really big computing devices that are out there. You do your big computation in native code on big computers. You do what's appropriate for Python on your local computer in Python. And I think that is about me. Thank you very much. <laughs>